So, Jeff, thank you for joining us today. Of course. Um, it'd be impossible to start this any other way. Um, you just recently announced that you're going to be hanging up the flannel next year. Um, this is big news. Uh, is there anything you want to share with this group on why you made this decision now? Well, uh, thanks for having me today, Darmesh. It, um, look, I don't have another job. Uh, I'm so proud of what our company has built over the last 25 years. Uh, I've been fortunate to have been a part of it for 21 of those of those years. Um, I've made so many friends and worked on so many amazing things. You know, when, when COVID started, I was worried about how we would sort of work through it. And the company has really shown, I think, over the last few months, and it's in great shape. I have a successor who's totally ready, uh, who you know well, yeah. uh, Dave. And uh, I think it's time. I mean, I, there's some things that I've put on the back burner personally for 20 years that I want to work on. And um, uh, so it's just time. I couldn't be more proud of or feel more fortunate for the opportunity that I've had over the last 21 years to help build this company. Jeff, you know, while we're of course going to miss you, I think it makes a lot of sense what you're doing and it sounds really exciting. You know, it's really impressive to think about all that you've seen over the last 21 years. Um, and I'm glad we get a chance today to spend a little time with you and hear about some of your stories and your insights. And so let's start by going back to the beginning. You know, when you joined Amazon two decades ago, um, you came from more of a manufacturing mindset and used that to help build out our operations network. And so can you tell us a little bit about your background and the strategy for how Amazon's operations network was developed? Sure. Well, I showed up in 1999 and I had come from manufacturing electronic components, polymers, pharmaceuticals, not retail warehousing. <laughs> yeah. So when I first walked into one of our fulfillment centers, I didn't see a warehouse, I saw a factory. Everything looked like the kinds of things that I saw in assembly plants. And I used the same language and thought about improving them in the way that you'd improve a plant. Yeah. Well, it turned out to get through the holiday every year, we had to figure out how to bust through a lot of bottlenecks, which is kind of what you have to do when you're running a plant. Right. And I had a playbook that came from manufacturing that included things like lean manufacturing, uh, total quality, Six Sigma, statistical process control, and a bunch of tools that are about improving the way a factory operates. We didn't have time if we were going to get through those bottlenecks for the holiday to invent a whole new way. So I took the playbook that I had, which came from manufacturing, and implemented it in retail. It was really the first time that some of these techniques had been applied in a retail environment. And fortunately, they worked. Uh, one of the things that we did was reorganize the way goods flowed through our warehouses from a traditional kind of push system where you do batch picks, uh, you know in advance what the orders are going to be, you have 48 hours to do it. That's kind of a traditional warehouse environment, certainly at the time. And we switched it around to process orders as they came in from customers in kind of a pull system, real time. So very short cycle times, lower waste, lower defects, uh, and it it produced a, a precision that allowed us to make promises to customers that were like, want it tomorrow, order in the next three hours and 42 minutes. And you know, we've had that on the website since 2003 or so. That's called Fast Track. And that's what enabled us to launch Prime. Prime is basically, at least at its inception, was a subscription to this capability that we'd built in operations called Fast Track that let us make a very precise promise and keep it. Well, of course, we were thinking about how we could help sellers and uh, there was a team working on the idea that we might offer this operating capability to sellers as fulfillment by Amazon. And uh, so you can imagine before FBA, we had a retail team that was doing the ordering. So they're, they know exactly what they're ordering. They know the dimensions, they know the quantity. It comes in in full truck loads, maybe a pallet of the same SKU and worst case, It'd be a mixed pallet with, uh, with cases of different SKUs. That's about as bad as it got. But we always knew what was coming in and when. I had to go to the ops team when we began to work on FBA and say, good news, guys. We're going to switch things up a little bit. We're going to offer a program to sellers that lets them send in whatever they want to send in. So we have no idea what's coming in, what the quantity is, when it's going to arrive. You know, good luck. <laughs> uh, fortunately, that turned out to be an amazing set of processes and, and a, an amazing product for sellers because it allowed them to not worry about inventory storage and hook into our fast track system so that they could get uh, a delivery promise that was you know a part of prime and as good as our retail 
operations. Uh, since FBA launched, we've launched a number of other products, and you know, you've been a big part of, of this. Uh, we launched a handmade business for uh, artisans and people who make crafts to, to sell their wares. We launched Amazon Business and included FBA in Amazon Business. That lets the, both of those let a particular set of sellers address a very specific set of customers. And there, we'll do more of that over time. And then we've launched ways for brands to, uh, to reach customers better on Amazon, including brand registry and some other brand building resources. And we'll have a lot more to do there over time. Awesome. Well, it's, it's interesting to reflect on those examples from our operations team. And as you note, there's been a tremendous amount of innovation over decades. Mm -hmm. Um, and that innovation has always started with the customer and worked backwards. And it's something, you know, we all know that customer obsession is one of Amazon's core leadership principles. And we constantly think about it. We think about it every day, multiple times a day, um, in the products we build, in the processes we create, in the people we hire. Um, how do you think about sellers fitting into the priorities of a customer-centric company like Amazon? Well, of course, they're a, they're a top priority, but let me spin back to when we decided to do this. So in 1999, we first welcomed third-party sellers to the store. You know, we could have kept our store to ourselves forever. We could have just stayed as a, just a retailer, operated our store, never allowed third parties to sell next to us. But we actually thought, hey, if we allow sellers to bring their selection, mm -hmm. it's gonna improve the customer's experience faster than we could probably do it with retail. And that's gonna be good for Amazon, good for the sellers, and good for customers. So we launch it, it turns out we were right. Within the first year, 5% of sales were a third party, and it, you know, it, went, it just was a rocket ship. So now, as you know, 60% or so of the sales on Amazon are third party. Uh, FBA houses uh, an enormous amount of third party inventory, more than half of the inventory in our warehouses is uh, is third party. There are 1.7 million small and medium businesses. Uh, I'll, for the rest of our talk, I'll probably use SMB just so we can <laughs> shorten it. Uh, but there are 1.7 million SMBs now in Amazon store. And more than 200,000 sellers have surpassed $100,000 in sales in 2019. And the average is 160,000 a year. So sellers are succeeding and it's great for all of us. Um, Jeff, so it, it is amazing to look at all of the success that small businesses have had over the years. And, you know, as you've noted, going from what was at 1.0 to now almost 60% of sales. But, you know, does it, does it worry you that in many senses, this is also a statement that small business selling partners are kicking the butt of Amazon retail? No, it does not worry us at all. In fact, we love it. We're proud to support small businesses. And one of the reasons is that they create so many jobs. You know, Amazon created uh, a million jobs in the last 25 years. Well, this is another way that sellers have done better. They've created in the US alone, 1.1 million jobs. So this is great for everybody. It's great for customers, sellers, and it's great for Amazon too. Prioritizing seller success is just a total no brainer for us. Our goal is to help sellers thrive and if they thrive, they bring more selection, they lower prices, our customers benefit. So there's a bunch of things that we're doing to improve the seller experience so that it's even easier to list and sell and build a business. We're investing in the two years, 2019 and 2020, we're investing $30 billion in logistics and tools and programs and products and process changes to improve the selling experience. And, uh, and there'll be more investments to come. We're committed to educating 500,000 US SMBs uh, next year, well, actually over the course of this year and next year, in how to make better use of the digital channel. And we're gonna help 100,000 new US SMBs bring their business online to Amazon. You know, I totally agree, Jeff. The growth of small businesses, it's been awesome. Um, but you know, if we're real about it, this year has brought a lot of challenges as well. Um, with COVID-19 and the pandemic, it's transformed how we live our personal lives. It's transformed how we work. Um, you know, we've had to make a lot of changes internally. Consumers have changed how they shop. Um, businesses have faced all sorts of challenges. Some businesses have had to take big hits or have had to close as a result. You know, as, as we have a bunch of SMBs out there today listening, 
Do you have any advice on what you think will be critical as um, we all figure out how to thrive in this world as we inch towards recovery from COVID-19? Well, you're right. A lot of things uh, have happened. And, and um, you know, first, I just want to uh, recognize all the people that have suffered, you know, over the, the last six months and, and also all the great work of the businesses, many of whom are represented, you know, in, in Accelerate here, uh, who have done so much to help the people who, who didn't have as many options uh, through these six months. Uh, so a lot of amazing work has gone on. But I think in terms of navigating this COVID world and the post, you know, post-COVID world, the important thing is to focus on what doesn't change for customers. So customers are going to want low prices. There's no customer that comes to me and says, hey, could you raise prices on something? They're going to want a big selection, not a smaller selection. And they're going to want a fast and convenient delivery. And I don't think that's going to change. And now, those ideas, I think, are even more important when we're in this constrained environment. For example, if you wanted to find the selection that's available in Amazon's store by driving only to physical stores, you have to do a lot of driving. You'd have to hit a lot of stores and you'd probably have to drive all over town. So that's a lot of time. And you know, often, I think people undervalue their, the time that they have to expend going to the store, and they certainly undervalue, undervalue the costs of operating their vehicle and the pollution and so on. So you save money, you save time, and you have the opportunity to reach uh, a much va more vast selection uh, you know, shopping with us. And we think that's a, that's a consistent theme that helps during COVID and is going to continue afterward. This is why we pour energy into improvements in Prime. It's why we've invested in increasing the grocery delivery capacity by 160% just in the last six months. You know, again, I think it's really important for sellers to focus on these durable ideas. So the idea that, you know, you can lower your costs as a seller, which allows you to compete more effectively on price, that's a win for COVID and it's a win for the long run. Finding selection that customers really want, you know, kind of holes in the offering that we have where you can satisfy the needs of customers, that's gonna work forever. Uh, and these principles should guide, I think, sellers both during COVID and as we move toward recovery. So let's talk a little bit about how Amazon's had to manage through COVID um, so far. You know, I think our, uh, our sellers understand that we've also faced significant challenges. Mm -hmm. um, there's been an increase in customer demand. It's super important that we're ensuring the safety of our fulfillment center workers and our transportation workers. Mm -hmm. Um, but as a result, um, at times, and certainly as we go into holiday, we've had to put additional limits on FBA inbound and inventory. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about you know, some of these very tough decisions that we've had to make over the last six months, um, both early in the crisis and kind of how Amazon's thought about how to wrestle with those challenges? COVID impacted supply chains around the world in a staggering way. You know, factories closed, so inventory wasn't available. Shipping was disrupted inventory space and warehousing was disrupted kind of all over the world. So the first thing is we really appreciate our sellers partnering with us and their patients in understanding as we kind of work through this together kind of worldwide. Um, the first thing we did is focus on the safety of our employees because without that, I think nothing else would have mattered. So we made a, over 150 changes to our processes and some of the most impactful ones would be, for example, related to social distancing. So, you know, when you have people working in a fulfillment center and you say now you, you can't be within six feet of each other, there are processes that required people before to hand things off and be a little closer. And we had to change all those processes, which actually lowered our capacity for a little while, uh, which is one of the reasons we went out and, and, uh, and hired 175,000 more people so that we could meet the demand uh, of retail and our, and our third party business. Our leadership team during this crisis met every single day. We focused on processes. We focused on the performance of our fulfillment centers and our operating network. We were watching metrics for the seller community overall and for our retail teams. We decided pretty early on to focus on the things that we thought customers would need the most, especially in the early weeks of the crisis. So things like medical supplies, um, you know, other critical products that they, they would need, food, uh, some of the basic staples to kind of get by. And we prioritized making room in inventory for those items, but we wanted to make sure that, that sellers had room too. So one of the things I had to do pretty early on was go to the retail teams and say, you know, we're going to constrain 
our retail inventory so that we have space for sellers to send in the things that they think are going to sell. And, and that means we're going to constrain our business a little bit. And it turns out that 3P sales actually grew faster than retail, even during the COVID crisis, because we were able to kind of balance that inventory. So look, we understand that COVID has had a huge impact on everybody, including our sellers. And so we've done some things to try to help and make it a little bit easier to, uh, to sustain businesses through this time. So we've waived certain fees. We've paused loan repay for the sellers who have borrowed money to, to buy inventory. And we've relaxed some of our policies on shipping performance to make sure that we weren't penalizing uh, sellers when everything was so disrupted. And as you know, we're not in normal times yet, uh, but customers are gonna need to lean on us throughout this crisis. And so our partnership and the performance of sellers and Amazon retail are gonna matter a ton for them. So Dharmesh, the holidays are already fast approaching and we expect this peak for the entire retail industry is gonna be enormously challenged by what's going on with COVID and with broader transportation challenges across America. Can you tell us what the teams are working on to make sure that we're ready to serve customers for the holiday? Yeah, well, let me, um, let me actually step back. You know, if I look at all of 2020, you know, this year we'll invest more than $18 billion in small and medium business success. You know, as you noted, it's everything from the tools and technology and teams to the operations and fulfillment centers. Actually, we've already released over 135 new tools just this year. It's awesome. Um, and so there's a lot going on there, but this holiday is gonna be different. Um, and it's not just different for us, it's gonna be different across the industry. The, the reality is it's likely with where COVID is that physical stores are still gonna struggle. Some will be closed or locked down in certain communities. Um, some may have reduced capacity. And every peak, we always see that transportation networks um, have a surge. They have a surge in people trying to buy things before holiday. That's normal, but with kind of what's going on with physical stores, this year that surge is gonna be even bigger. And so we're doing a lot, um, you touched a little bit on this, to add capacity, right? We've hired a bunch more people, we're adding new fulfillment centers, and we've changed how we do some of these processes. We've created temporary uh, locations and facilities to be able to process more and more. Um, but the reality is um, we're worried. We're worried about what's gonna happen to the transportation network across the United States, um, not unique to us, but to all of um, retail as people get ready for holiday. And so it's even one of the reasons we've put Prime Day where it is. Mm. Um, Prime Day is always a great opportunity for customers, particularly Prime customers to find great deals. But by putting it where we have, um, we're hoping it's gonna help pull up some of holiday shopping so that customers can buy earlier for holiday. And um, you know, one of the um, things we haven't shared broadly, but uh, I'm very excited about is as part of that, we're gonna spend over a hundred million dollars specifically on how we connect customers to small business sellers and their products during Prime Day and through the holiday season to again, help surface these amazing products from small businesses um, and also pull through that demand earlier for customers and for sellers. And so the, the advice I keep giving is if you're a customer and you're going shopping, buy early. And if you're a <laughs> seller and you're thinking about holiday, sell early. You know, run your deals, launch your new products as early as you can so that you don't hit some of this disruption that has a good chance of happening um, just across the transportation network in America um, as we get closer to holiday. And I'll acknowledge there's no playbook for how you run in a pandemic. You know, we've had to focus on being nimble and making lots of changes. Um, you know, if I look back uh, as, as this all started, you know, we try to do a lot to communicate with sellers to try and let them know um, what was going on and changes they should make. Um, I think we can continue to do better there to provide communications faster and earlier. And we're definitely gonna try and do that as we go into holiday because there will be changes that come up and we've gotta pivot fast sometimes. We'll use our support teams, we'll use our forums, our newsletters, we'll use all of those different assets and things like this conference um, to really try and help sellers be ready for holiday and peak. Um, you know, we appreciate the partnership of our selling partners. You know, as you've touched on earlier, we couldn't do all of this amazing work for customers if we didn't have this great partnership. And so we're gonna keep working together to try and delight customers and we appreciate sellers um, working with us as we navigate this very unique holiday period. That's such a great message, Dharmesh, thanks. Thanks to you and the team. Uh, there's a lot of work ahead of us. <laughs> um, all right, so we've talked through some examples of how we're helping sellers handle this crisis period, but you and your team are now on the front lines 
And you've also seen how sellers are supporting their communities during this pandemic too. Are there any examples that stand out for you? Oh, there are so many examples. You know, it's, it's interesting. This is a, it's, a, it's a very challenging time. It's challenging not just in how do you run a small business and keep your workers employed and navigate COVID and social distancing and changes in demand patterns. Um, there's all of that challenge on kind of just how to run a business, all the challenges people have in their personal lives. But it's really been inspiring to see some of these ways that um, our sellers in giving back in their communities. Um, you know, I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, one um, very close to home for me, uh, a company um, called Palouse Brand. Um, they're based here in Eastern Washington. Um, they're a brand that sells non-perishable food products. And you could imagine um, in a time like this, um, as folks are worried about their food supply and making sure they've got products stocked up, they saw a surge in demand, a surge in customer demand for their non-perishable food products, um, which is great. And one of the ways that they're giving back is simply by job creation in their community. You know, they, as a single business, have hired 50 new employees, mostly single mothers and individuals who are newly unemployed because of what's going on with COVID. Um, you know, you talked earlier about the 1.1 million jobs that sellers have created, and that's an amazing way that sellers are giving back to the community and creating careers for individuals. Um, another example, a company called Sheets and Giggles. They're based in Colorado. Um, they make sustainable bedding, um, a great product. Um, as uh, COVID came along, they looked at that as an opportunity to say, how could they help? And they donated hundreds of sheet sets to healthcare institutions, um, to homeless shelters and other housing facilities. They donated $40,000 to the Colorado COVID-19 Emergency Relief Fund. Um, just another way that they're giving back. Um, and so one of the things I love about Amazon as an employee here is that as a company, we have this strong commitment to how we give back to the community. Yeah. And one of the things I love about our selling partners is so many of them have exactly that same philosophy. And there's so many inspiring stories from all around that um, are so diverse and very unique ways to give back to local communities. So great. Um, well, uh, Jeff, you know, we've talked a lot about how much we value small businesses, how critical they are to customers, how they're doing amazing things for their communities. Um, but let me go back to about how Amazon competes with selling partners. You know, it's a topic that's gotten a lot of scrutiny. It's gotten a lot of discussion on um, Amazon's competition with um, our selling partners. And, you know, we saw this recently in Washington, D.C., um, when Jeff Bezos was faced on, um, with questions on competition from Congress. Um, is there anything you'd want to share, you know, while we're talking about that topic with our selling community on how we approach competition with our sellers? Well, as we've talked about all day today, sellers are incredibly important to Amazon because they're important to the customer experience. And when we improve the customer experience together, it works for everybody. It works for sellers, works for Amazon, works for the customers. So we have no interest. It doesn't make sense for us to limit the performance of sellers in any way. So I know one of the top concerns is our private label business. I want to remind everybody that private label products are incredibly common in retail and they're good for customers. People, retailers create private label products because they identify an opportunity to offer something, maybe a higher quality, better value, something that uh, the customers can't find in, a, in another way. And we're operating just like other retailers when we do this. Our private label sales are 1% of our sales. Many of the other retailers out there are 15 to 85% of their, of their sales are private label. So this is a very small part of what we sell in retail. And the reason we're doing it is again, because we can offer a better product to customers. We do not look at individual seller data when we decide what products to launch in private label. We don't know if other retailers have policies like we do, but we strictly prohibit our employees, and some of them work in, in your area too, from looking at any data that's non-public, seller-specific, in support of the private label businesses. We just don't allow this. Do we just prohibit it, or is there anything more we do? No, this that? is a great question. So, so beyond just a policy, we train everybody, we have technology that looks for places where the policy has been violated. Um, we have authorization rules that actually prohibit the 
people who aren't authorized from looking into the systems and finding this information. And we're continually enhancing these safeguards and we're spending millions of dollars to improve this technology. And if someone breaks the rules, we're gonna take action. So, you know, we don't think, we, we understand there are reports of a few violations. We don't believe that they're accurate, but just to be sure, we've launched an internal investigation to get to the bottom of it. Well, thank you, Jeff. It's a super important topic and it's good to hear it's not just a policy, but it's kind of an ongoing program to keep getting better and ensure those policies are upheld very, very well. Yeah. I mean, again, it doesn't make any sense for us to do something that's not in the interest of sellers. All right. Well, continuing on this thread of how we protect our selling partners and work with them and brands, how is Amazon protecting brand owners and fighting fraud and abuse there? Well, you know, it's, it's um, a super important topic. You know, we invest a tremendous amount of time and resources to protect not only our customers, but also brands and our selling partners. Um, you know, it, it's just a fact that if you have a bad experience, if you, and you know, as a customer, if you receive a product that's damaged, if it arrives late, if it's not the product you ordered, it's, it's expired. Or as a seller, if you've got to compete with someone that's trying to acquire fake reviews. Um, or These are terrible experiences. Terrible experiences. And the reality of the matter is that if you're a customer, you have a lot of choices. And if you have that bad experience on Amazon, the thing we know happens is that person leaves. They shop less. Totally. And if you're a seller and you have a bad experience, or if we make a mistake in enforcement, that seller has other options and they will decrease their commitment to Amazon. And so, you know, in 2019, we invested more than $500 million. We had over 8,000 employees on our team that were focused on protecting our store from fraud and abuse. Um, you know, we've made a lot of progress in this year. We continue to stop a lot of bad actors. Just last year, we stopped two and a half million bad actor accounts from launching as sellers before they were able to get a single product up for sale. We stopped more than 6 billion listings that bad actors were trying to get up that we thought were bad um, before they ever got up, but got ever seen by a customer or ever harmed another seller who might be competing with them. Um, and so there's a lot that we do there, um, but it's not just what we can do on our own. Over the years, we've also invested a lot in tools for brand owners um, so that we can partner together to stop bad actors. You know, it's things like brand registry and transparency and Project Zero. You know, Project Zero is this interesting program we launched um, just a little over a year ago um, and now has over 10,000 brands using it. And it really harnesses um, the strengths of Amazon and the strengths of brands. Amazon's got amazing technology, machine learning, and science that can operate at massive scale. Brands have deep knowledge of their products and their intellectual property. And it marries those two things together through a set of automated protections, but also these powerful self-service tools so that if a brand ever sees something that's wrong in our store and they find a counterfeit, they can just pull it down. It's like an andon cord. For... It's like an andon cord. Yeah just like in a lean manufacturing process. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, it's been awesome. And you know, so Project Zero's got over 10,000 brands. We've got um, this program called Transparency that allows a brand to uniquely serialize and identify every item that's manufactured. Um, and it allows us to scan and prevent those, uh, a potential counterfeit product from ever being sold in our store. You know, we have more than 7,500 brands now using Transparency and collectively, We've stopped 300,000 counterfeits before they were ever uh, shipped out to a customer. Um, but it's not just all of this proactive work we do to prevent fraud and abuse before it gets into our store. But if we ever get something wrong and someone gets through, we've got to make sure we hold these people accountable. And so earlier this year, we were excited to launch the Amazon Counterfeit Crimes Unit. We call it CCU because um, we like acronyms a lot. Um, but that counterfeit crimes unit is going to make sure and do everything we can to ensure these bad actors are held accountable, whether that's through civil litigation and the court system or it's working with law enforcement all around the world um, to prosecute these individuals. And um, we've had some good wins and successes in doing that over the last few months, um, but there's much more that we need to do there in partnership with law enforcement. And last, um, we want to make it easy, whether you're a brand or a selling partner, um, to let us know if we got it wrong. You know, with Brand Registry, we created this powerful report of violation tool so that if um, a brand thought um, there was an issue with a product in our store, they could tell us, they could find it really easily and report it to us and we could quickly take action. And um, we've made it easy for sellers through our account health dashboard to do the same and report violations and we investigate and take action. And 
Look, the, the reality is we're, we're lucky and sellers are lucky that we together have created this amazing store that does delightful things for customers and brings a large selection and a lot of products to them. Unfortunately, that means that bad actors are going to try and game this. And so we're going to continue to invest whatever is necessary to stay ahead of those bad actors and ensure we can create a trustworthy store for customers, for brands, and for our selling partners. I love that we're so focused on this. Totally. It's critical. Um, well, Jeff, you know, I know as we're about to wrap up, um, we have quite a few people watching who are actually new to selling um, or may not have actually ever sold at all, and they're kind of thinking about it. You know, as you look back on the last 21 years, um, and I know it's hard, 21 years, you've got a lot of stories, so many sellers you've met, so many small businesses. Um, but I'd love uh, if you could share, you know, a favorite story about a small business that's growing with Amazon, and if you have any tips for other small businesses as they're thinking about how to be successful. So uh, I, you're, you're right, there are lots of stories and there's, there's some amazing things to be really proud of. There's one that maybe I'll call out today. There's a Native American um, store out of uh, Minot, North Dakota called uh, uh, Poem Studios. And uh, so Poem is People of Earth Matter. And um, they make these amazing and intricate wood and metal wall hangings, you know, customized. So uh, you know, for each customer, it's, it's super creative. Uh, they look beautiful. It's uh, Native American owned. And um, they've had the opportunity to grow their business by selling these customized products on Amazon uh, since 2018. Um, beautiful work. And I love the story of the impact they can have in the community. Uh, look, there are lots of business models that you could choose to succeed as a seller. I mean, the one I just described, Poem Studios, they're succeeding by making very high quality customized items and, uh, you know, and selling them at a fair cost. You could decide to raise prices on, on whatever you're selling and maximize your profit margin. You could chase the latest trends and you know, get in big and sell when the thing becomes hot for Christmas and try to get out before everybody else jumps in and that's one strategy. We think the best strategy for sellers is to focus on the things that we've been talking about today yeah. that customers love that aren't going to change. They're going to love low prices. They're going to love great selection. And they're going to love a convenient experience. So I would ask sellers to focus on your costs. Do what you can to allow your business to be able to afford lower prices so that you can improve, you can compete more effectively and you can improve the customer experience by offering low prices. Look for selection that uh, isn't quite met by the other sellers and by Amazon retail and, you know, and, and make offers there. Improve your listings. So improve the information, the, the images, the text, the information about your product so that customers understand it and are more likely to, you know, to wanna buy that particular selection. And ensure timely delivery, including by joining FBA, uh, you know, if you haven't already. I guess my, my last piece of advice for people, this is, this is work for, for me too, is do what you love. I mean, turns out I'm kind of a operations geek and I've, got, I've had the chance to be around that, including with sellers for 21 years. Yeah. Um, and so I've done what I've loved. If you're onto something and it's working, it's resonating with customers in a big way, man, double down, keep doing it. And if you do, you, Amazon, and especially our customers will win. Well, Jeff, uh, that's all the time we have today. And I know the things we've discussed all the way from you know, where we've come from, where we're going, and how to think about building a successful business, they're really top of mind for our entire selling community as we plan for a successful holiday and beyond. And so I just want to take a moment on behalf of many, many people to thank you for your more than 20 years of inventing on behalf of our customers and our selling partners, and for joining us today to kick off Amazon Accelerate. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Dharmesh, and thanks to all the sellers. 